Hi, I'm Paco Nathan with O'Reilly Media, and we're here at JupyterCon in New York City. And I have the pleasure of uh, joining us here. Demba Ba is Assistant Professor of Electrical Engineering and Biomedical Engineering at Excellent. Harvard University. Uh, and Demba and I were just talking, uh, really looking forward to your keynote. Uh, we were talking about the theme of using Jupiter almost as scaffolding, I think is what we're saying, but where people can get the confidence to jump into this kind of computer science, uh, you know, a, a real technical type of tooling, but without that technical background necessarily. Absolutely, absolutely. How, how is that working out? How has that been set up at, at Harvard? First of all, it's great to be here, uh, Paco, and wow. especially for somebody like me who comes more from an academic background, but I like to be part of these communities, so it's, uh, it's great to be here and to be having this conversation with you. So how has that been uh, going? It's been going great. So I, I, I came at this from a very, very selfish perspective. So essentially, in the sense that, so when Jupiter started coming around, I had just finished grad school, data science had started becoming hot, right. and I was trying to get into this. And coming at this from like a non-CS background, these are not tools that we're traditionally taught. And basically what I did is when I started my position at Harvard, I was like, hey, wouldn't it be nice if I could teach to the students the kind of class that I would have wanted to be taught? Mm -hmm. And Jupiter was a perfect uh, plugging into that. And it's essentially what you said. So for people that do not come to data science or programming from a traditional CS background, there's a certain amount of inertia that comes from the fact that a lot of things need to be done before you can actually get to coding, setting up an environment, right. figuring out dependencies and so forth. So what we've been trying to do at Harvard and myself in particular is how do you essentially build that infrastructure for the students okay. to essentially make them relax through the process at the beginning using that as training wheels and after that they just run with it. And I'll show great examples of things some of the students have done just because they gained that confidence. Now, is it expensive to be able to set up this kind of infrastructure for students? So, so, so it costs us, believe it or not, and this is the most surprising thing to me. So we've done some numbers. So the first time I presented this, we had an iteration where we were using Docker, right. and we had this problem of scaling up and down. I think right. you and I had talked talking, about this, yeah. right? And our engineers have been working on this, and they figured out a system where now we're able to deploy machines on AWS on demand. Oh, and for a class that I taught last semester, for an average of 30 hours a week spent by a student on the platform, this cost us $3 for the whole semester. <laughs> that, that's the amazing part. L less than you're probably paying for a phone, like a cell phone. Absolutely. That, that's the amazing part. Wow. And, and for that, you're getting access on a cluster. You're able to run some sophisticated machine learning sensor uh, Yeah, so, so, so the basic thing you get for this as a student, say, who, who's in my data science decision theory class, right. is you get a machine on Amazon with four gigs of RAM, okay. a pretty good processor, and sometimes even more than one processor. Okay. And so it's essentially a cheap laptop that you have on demand that runs Jupyter, and you have access to a terminal, so if you're savvy, you can essentially do whatever you want. Wonderful. Yeah. What what kinds of projects are, are your students working on then with this? So so the the most interesting one, and it's a shame that I won't be able to talk about it at length tomorrow during the keynote. But yeah. I had an undergrad who took my undergraduate level class. So it's engineering sciences one five five, and it's biomedical signal processing. But what I call it is labs in the wild. Okay. So the idea is the following. The idea is that we're going to give the students wearables. Uh, so let me step back for a second. So the idea is how do you make data science real? Okay. We're going to give you wearables. And I'm, as an educator, I'm going to put together assignments where your job is going to be to collect data on yourself. And I'm going to give you this platform where you actually can upload the data and have access to a programming environment that we set up in advance with modules that we need to use and so forth for the class. And to this, you're going to learn slowly and slowly how to interact with data. So one of my students took this class and ended up doing an undergrad thesis with me. So he studied a project during the class that was about... Uh, Predicting the outcome of a basketball shot. <laughs> Perfect. Before it goes in. <laughs> Perfect. Like real-time analysis. Like real-time analysis. Oh, and he great. did not do this in the class. But his undergrad thesis, which he got a honorable mention from our dean as an undergrad thesis, he built the system from front to back. Oh. And this is a student who came into my class. He had probably coded in MATLAB before, but never really, really had any true programming experience. And this ended up being his undergrad thesis. I mean, this, this made me really, really happy. Oh, outstanding. Yeah. 
And that's a lot of integration to do too, I can imagine. It's not just... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's from developing the part that actually works offline to in this particular case. So, so this student's name is Ryan, Ryan Halverson. Yeah. He built, he got some accelerometers, the bare bone sensors. Right. He sewed them onto a sleeve that a basketball player could wear. And he wrote the machine learning algorithms to run on the hardware and had a deployment where essentially if I had this device, I could put it on and take a shot and it would inform me before the ball goes in whether it thinks it's going to go in or not. Uh-huh. I mean, this is tremendous. And this uh-huh. is in the space of a year. Uh-huh. Well, he took my class in the semester and in the next year, this was his undergrad thesis. Amazing. What, what kinds of applications then? I mean, moving beyond industry, or sorry, academia, moving out into industry or out into government or, or out into what they'll be doing in their careers later, what kind of applications could this type of work open up? So, so this type of work is in like, like this example in particular or? Well, and, and what you're working with in terms of sensors and I mean, being able to build up accelerometers and all kinds of sensors on clothing, I can imagine have a lot of practicality in, in uh, different settings. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it's medicine or industrial or Absolutely. agriculture or anything. Absolutely. Um, but the fact that, that you're getting students who aren't necessarily computer scientists and they're looking at applications now and mm-hmm. they're being enabled, mm-hmm. um, how can they take that out into the world in, in terms of other types of applications? So so th- that's, that's an interesting question. So, so my philosophy on this is, so in the case of Ryan in particular, this is a great example. I think the reason Ryan pursued this particular project was that he was on the football team. He's a varsity player. Okay. And he's played basketball at the high school level. So what I try to encourage the students to do is, hey, this is the class, and this is what we've got to play with, signals, biological signals, but I want you to carve for yourself something that matches your interests because it keeps the engagement. But in terms of applications that I think this could enable, one of the ones that's really hot right now is uh, sports analytics right. and smart sports monitoring and sensors. More and more teams in the NFL, in the MLB, are actually leveraging these kind of things. So now you're talking about not necessarily having to make contributions on the machine learning end, so, but there's a need for folks that, say, have an understanding of body physiology wow. that will now go after undergraduate work for companies and that now have these skills. Hey, we can actually build a system that works with this. But, I mean, one thing you're alluding to is that I don't think this is by any means... So this is not meant to replace, say, a formal training in machine learning or in computer science and programming. It's more as training wheels and then letting the students decide, hey, is this something I want to pursue further? So sports analytics uh, is one. One that you mentioned that's really important and that's getting a lot of attention now is uh, healthcare monitoring. Yeah, I imagine. So you you, you see a lot of hospitals, for example, that want to be able to track the health of their patients while they're not in the hospital because this means you have to pay more when they're in the hospital, right? Right. So outpatients, say elderly, somebody who's getting older yeah. and maybe yeah. they're having troubles walking or they might fall or yeah. things yeah. like this. And another one that's, that's really interesting to me that is and is not related to sensors is smart cities. A lot of cities are talking about this. In fact, I'm trying to get a partnership started with the city of Boston to essentially help communities take ownership of decisions that are going to be made about them. So you have a lot of data collected, for example, about traffic conditions in certain neighborhoods, pollution and so forth. And decisions are ma- being made at city government level, at the state level, as to what kind of infrastructure to build. And now you have, so it would be great if you, can, you could train undergrads who say, want to do a career in that realm, to have an understanding of programming, data, because this is being used more and more to make decisions at very, very high levels, and we're not training, we're not training the students that come out with this tool set to be able to take advantage of that, yeah. Now, given the kind of pricing and all, too, uh, we're, we're talking about here, U.S. cities, New York, Boston, etc., but what if we take this out in the rest of the world? I mean, given that kind of price point of somebody doing really interesting work, but for like $3 a month for the compute infrastructure, um, what, what can that do out in the rest of the world? Yeah, that's, 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 that's a great question. So, I mean, I'll, I'll take the example of, uh, so I was, I was born in Senegal, so I'm originally from West Africa. And some of the kind of problems that this could solve is wealth distribution. So you have the government that has trouble actually collecting data from uh, communities that are far away and that do not have necessarily access to big cities right. where decisions are being made, right? right? 
So now, if we, if we build this into sensors, where the communities can act, so you have local people, so decentralize this, and you have local people that are able to collect data about, hey, what does the community think about issue X, Y, and Z, right? All of a sudden, if you're able to build a portal where these data are gathered, right, mm -hmm. and you have smart kids, 18, 19, 20, that are interested in, interested in data, right, this can dramatically shift decision-making at, at those particular levels. Um, and, I mean, other interesting examples, for example, are so potentially a controversial topic, but policing, right? Sure. And, I mean, you have cameras that are on board everywhere. Everybody has a smartphone and things like that, right? So not directly related to the developing world, right? right. But this is an example of traditionally data are not being used to understand these kind of problems. Well, that's interesting, too. Eh? When you talk about um, biosignals, or I, I guess you would say biosignals or biomedical signals, yeah. uh, but just what we're getting off of our smartphones, is that also a, a kind of passive signal that can be used? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I mean, I'm, I'm on Android, so, and I hack around with my phone a bit. So this has accelerometers in there. Right. I mean, pretty high-rate accelerometers. So... And some of them actually have sensors that potentially can capture things about temperature, body temperature. Oh. So now you're talking about decentralized health monitoring for uh, the developing world. So this, this is a very interesting story. So, so if you go to Senegal, so it's, it, I mean, it's, it's a developing country. So in most rural areas, it's a very poor country. But I, I don't have a phone that costs as much as an iPhone 7. But you'll have places where people have very sophisticated phones. Right. That are, that, are, that are essentially being used just to make phone calls. And imagine using the sensors that are already on board or having sensors added to those that could be used for health monitoring. So I don't remember the name of the device, but this is a very, very cool device being built of the size of a phone. I actually think it's a phone to take ultrasound images. So ultrasound imaging is one of the cheapest way we know now oh. to acquire images about the body. Gotcha. So r remote without having to have yeah, a yeah. lot of... Uh, yeah, remote, remote. And, and what makes this really interesting to me, and which is why I don't have a very good concrete answer to your question, is the following. So I typically find, and this is why I tell my students, do a project that's related to your interest, because once you put the technology there, you will see that there's problems on the ground right. that people are interested in solving. And once you enable them with the technology, you will slowly see where this is leading them. I think, yeah, it's, it's one of the big ways, I think, rather than being like, oh, hey, we should do X, Y, or Z. Right. Enable them with the technology and the tools, teach them the basics, and uh, people will just start running with it, yeah. And it sounds also enabling them through their passions. Absolutely. What they see. Absolutely, yeah. Wonderful. Well, we're really looking forward to Keynote. Yeah, and, thank you. Uh, want to hear much more about what you, what you work on there. Absolutely, thank you, yeah. Okay. yeah. It was great. Thanks a lot, Pedro. Yeah.